Happy Halloween, everybody. It is Denise Salcedo, and you are watching Speak Now Pro Wrestling. Here it is October 31st. It's officially Halloween. Uh, so I hope everybody here is having a very nice holiday. Uh, there's two types of people right now in Halloween, people that are at home, like me, and people that are out trick-or-treating. Uh, I haven't trick-or-treated, I think, in probably before COVID. Uh, so it's been a while since I've gone to go trick or treating. I personally miss it. Um, but it's one of those things where you get to a certain age and if you don't got any children to go with, then you kind of really can't go trick or treating, right? So I feel like, you know, right now, like my siblings who I used to go trick or treating with, they're a little older, so they like to go with their friends now. And so that kind of leaves the, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of leaves me out at this point. But uh, We'll see anyways, because I miss trick-or-treating. Trick-or-treating is fun, and there should be no age limit to trick-or-treating. But anyways, we got a Halloween Havoc week two to talk about here today, and it's going to be a fun one, I will say, because here's the thing about Halloween Havoc is that they did a really good job of building two nights. However, I will say, though, and I'm going to say this right off the bat, that Halloween week one uh, Halloween Havoc week one was a way stronger episode top to bottom than week two. So I did enjoy week one probably like a hundred times more, but there was still a lot of really good stuff on today's show. Uh, in particular, I cannot wait, of course, you guys know, to talk about the main event because that was the match of the night. That was the match that I would say that people were probably most looking forward to, given that we know the history and what Carmelo Hayes and Ilya Dragunov can do. Of course, this match, I would say, uh, was very different in the sense that before we kind of had these two very straightforward wrestling matches and we still got that we still pretty much got that for the main event however this time it kind of played into a bigger story and now this is the official I guess you can say we're kind of done right now with Carmelo Hayes and Ilya Dragunov because they both got other problems so they're kind of both going their separate ways right now because again they got problems and we need to get to them uh also we had a very very fun opening match that I can't wait to talk about we had the finals of the women's NXT breakout tournament uh to get into here today so we got some pretty good stuff up ahead of us everybody some pretty good stuff um all right so also i'm gonna kick things off by thanking sheldon jackson for sending in uh 10 brand new memberships sheldon i sent you a friend request on instagram uh we also got a super chat here from stephen marchuli who says call me crazy but Ilya dragunov versus brock lesnar someday please stephen i'm gonna be honest with you I completely love this idea, and it's something that I would kill to see. Are you kidding me? I would kill to see Ilya Dragunov, Brock Lesnar, and then again, I would want to see Ilya Dragunov like Sheamus, Ilya Dragunov, Drew McIntyre. I would love them to run back Ilya Dragunov and Gunther someday again. I know we've seen that a few times, but still, I would like to see it again. Um, there is a couple more people that I would love to see. I kind of want to see Ilya Dragunov versus everybody. Oh, you know who's one? This one's an underrated one. Uh, Ilya Dragunov versus Chad Gable. I would want to see that too, uh, just to kind of name a few. So, Steven, I agree with you. And yes, that would be a good one. And I would, oh, it would be so crazy to see what he would do in there with Brock Lesnar. Oh, boy, that would be so, so much fun. All right, so let's get to it, everybody. Also, thank you, everybody, for the um, costume comments. I've been having the best time ever doing all of these Halloween costumes. I did uh, Gold Dust for Saturday. I did yesterday was Rhea Ripley. Today, it's Tony Storm. And I've got one more tomorrow because I really wanted to do this costume while I was watching AEW Dynamite, the one I'm doing tomorrow. And so I'm going to have to wait and do it then. But it's the one I've been most looking forward to doing uh, this whole week. So I'm very excited. As Besides the Goldust one, because that one I had been looking forward to for a whole entire year. But I will say this, guys, as you watch the show, just know that I am an incredible amount of pain because... You would not believe it. This hairnet that is underneath this wig is absolutely killing me. It is pressing on my head like I have two freaking screwdrivers just or bolts or something smashing my head together. And then on top of that, it's kind of itchy. So it's not ideal. I hate wigs, but whatever. We're going to pull through. Uh, Darf Steven sends in a super chat saying, not able to watch NXT or tonight's post show live, but here's some love for my friend Denise. Thank you so much, Steven. It is okay. I know it's 
Halloween and people got people got lives, man. I know people are out there trick or treating, having a good time. So I do not blame you. Uh, Heidi Ho sends in a very generous super chat saying, "What a fun show across the board." Uh, rip to Julius Creed's back to um rip to Julius Creed's back though. Oh, okay. You had me confused. I was like, wait, what's happening? What are you saying? Heidi Ho here. What are we doing? Uh, no, no. So Julius, so Brutus and Julius, uh, they were on raw this Monday. And of course they were on announced for this match on NXT. I still think that we're going to be seeing them on the main roster, but yeah, we're no longer most likely going to be seeing them on NXT unless they do like a thing where we see them on both shows. They haven't really made that clear, but my assumption is that, uh, yeah, that they're staying over on the uh, main roster side since you, they already went and they had their match yesterday against Alpha Academy, and it was really freaking great, actually. They made a really great impression. Uh, of course, for those of us who watch NXT, are going to miss them on Tuesday night, so this was kind of like, a, you know, it was what it was, but uh, I can't wait to talk about that match because that was a really, really good one, too. Will Chisholm says, I'm glad they... I'm glad they're doing things with the women's tag team division now, too. Yes, so we are going to get into that in just a second. But that's the thing, man. And if you listen to my Friday night SmackDown post show, I've talked about this. But for like the last month, maybe month and a half, somewhere around there, they've been playing these vignettes and these teases for Isla Dawn and Alba Fire. But that's it. Like, they haven't actually, like, came out and done anything. And, like, the first thing I said was, how are you going to have these two girls who are doing this, like, witchy black magic type of character at least that's what we get from the vignettes how are you gonna have them do like do this and then not even bring them out on the month of halloween like what are we doing here smackdown what are we doing like these two characters should definitely be on uh your shows especially in the month of october so i was very happy to see them as hosts here tonight on nxt it was a really good use of them and something different from scarlet and uh uh freaking shotzi of course they did a phenomenal job for week one but it was nice to switch things up and have alba fire and isla dawn especially because they are both uh very familiar in the world of nxt so will chisholm thank you so much for the super chat as well, all right, so let's go, everybody. I'm going to kick things off with the main event because that is the creme de la creme of the show. So we had the third match, the third installment between Ilya Dragunov and Carmelo Hayes for the NXT Championship. Now, we've seen these two guys go at it before. Uh, freaking phenomenal work that these two guys have shared. They're 1-1, of course, with the last bout being won by Ilya Dragunov, which was the official title change. But now... We uh, ended up getting this match, and this one was one of those things where you kind of knew there, there's only so many times that you can run this match back. Of course, we're not going to complain because if they 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 go together like peanut butter and jelly, guys. Chips and dip. These two just go together. They are a match made in heaven when it comes to uh, in-ring chemistry, so definitely not going to complain there. But of course, we know that uh, it was looking like it was probably going to be the last match between them for a while. So let's break down what went down here. So, of course, Carmelo Hayes has been feeling down because he does not see himself as him unless he has the NXT championship. So, he ends up winning a number one contendership match, and that is how he ends up becoming the opponent of Ilya Dragunov here tonight. So, in this match, guys, there was a dead giveaway from the beginning, and it was meant to be a dead giveaway, I believe, that... Carmelo Hayes, in case we didn't already expect it, that Carmelo Hayes was indeed the one who attacked Trick Williams. I know we were kind of on the fence. We were like, is he? Is he? He has to be. But that is that too obvious? And we're second guessing ourselves, even though the answer is right in front of our face. Uh, it was one of those situations, right? But for the most part, I would say that most of us were like 99% sure that it was Carmelo Hayes who attacked Trick Williams. Well, Carmelo Hayes came out to this match wearing a shirt that said, Justice for trick. The second I saw that, I'm like, oh, he's overcompensating. He's overcompensating for a reason. He's trying to look innocent. Why is he trying to look innocent? Because he's the one who attacked Trick Williams. And so from that moment on, uh, I was kind of expecting for the big reveal uh, to be happening here tonight. So anyways, we get into this match. It probably started at 6.55. Now, NXT, for the most part, always does an overrun. They usually do like a 15-minute over, 10 to 15-minute overrun like every week, I feel. So they started this match really late. And I looked at it, and I'm like, okay, they're either going to stick to their overrun the way that they normally do and give us a good match, right? 
or they're going to do something that's going to cause the match to like abruptly finish. Right. So that's where I was kind of, you know, trying to predict while I was watching this match. But anyways, we got another phenomenal match between Ilya and Carmelo. Of course, this one does not compare to the first two that they had, but that's not to say uh, that this match wasn't also pay-per-view level. Like if you would have put this match on a pay-per-view, uh, it would have definitely rocked everybody's socks because it was definitely uh, that good. Like these guys can't do sucky. These guys cannot do bad work together. They just can't. So right off the bat in this match, we're getting like strikes and suplexes from both guys back and forth. We get Ilya hitting his awesome lariat. And anytime he hits that lariat, Carmelo Hayes sells that thing like crazy. At one point, well, we actually get a couple of spots that occur on the ring apron. You know, the hardest part of the mat, they always say it in every single promotion. Dear wrestling commentators, we already know that the ring apron is the hardest part of the ring. We know. You don't need to tell us all the dang time. Anytime there's a move on the ring apron, every single wrestling commentator says, oh my God, it's the hardest part of the ring. And I get it because you know, they're selling it. They want to you know, add a little extra pizzazz, a little extra flair, razzle-dazzle it. But we know already. Anyways, so there was a part where he spiked them on the ring apron. And that was really cool. They looked really awesome. We see Hayes hit his frog splash. There's a moment where uh, we see Ilya clear out the commentary table, goes to the barrack, goes to the top of the barricade where the fans are at. And he ends up doing an H bomb from the barricade to the commentary table. That was a really good uh, spot. They continue going back and forth. And then we finally get towards the end of this match where we see Ilya attempt to go for an H-bomb, but instead Carmelo Hayes gets him with a code breaker and he picks up all of this momentum. He goes to the top rope and it looks like he's about to get this win. You're getting the feeling. You're getting the feeling. And then Trick Williams comes out and Carmelo Hayes turns and he has the most guilty looking face ever. Like he has the, I seriously thought I put this guy away, but here he is haunting me like a ghost right now. And so we see Trick Williams come out and he is not happy. Trick Williams is usually always in a good mood. He always has a good vibe. He came out and he was freaking pissed off. So that told us everything we needed to know. And the match continues, of course. And Carmelo is there. He's shocked. So Ilya takes this as an advantage, punches him, superplexes him, and hits his Torpedo Moscow for the win. And so he defeats Carmelo Hayes and retains his NXT championship. Now, earlier I said that these two guys are parting different ways. So here's what's happening on both ends. With the Trick Williams, Carmelo Hayes situation, Trick Williams came out and basically just like confronted Carmelo Hayes. But before he can say or really do anything, there was like breaking news because there was an attack behind the scenes, behind the stage in which Ilya, Ilya Dragunov, when he went to the back, he was attacked by Trick, I mean, sorry, by Baron Corbin. He was attacked by Baron Corbin and Baron Corbin had been coming after Ilya Dragunov for a while. Uh, he was actually one of the guys that I actually thought was going to win the number one contendership match. But so he attacks Ilya Dragunov and that's where we're at. Two um two ways to end the show. Two two sort of cliffhangers is what they did there because it left you wondering what the hell is Trick Williams going to do or say to Carmelo Hayes? We'll have to find out next week. And then of course, when anybody gets attacked, you're gonna be like, okay, how's this person gonna get? revenge on this other person for attacking them. So I thought they did a really good job of giving the people what they want in this main event, which is to still see an actual matchup between these two guys, because that's what they're known for. And on top of that, they continue to further uh, these new feuds and these new storylines that they're doing, right? So I thought this was a win-win situation when it came to the main event of Halloween Havoc. We got a couple of super chats here from uh, a couple of people. So let's get to them. This one's from Brandon James uh, doesn't write anything, but thank you so much, Brandon, for sending this in. Much appreciated. We got one here from Jay Stone who says, putting the belt on Elio was quite the decision because who realistically can take it from him? See, but here's the thing, though, Jay, is that I get it, right? Like, I'm not buying that, like, Baron Corbin's going to take away the belt from Elia Dragunov. Like, let's be real. I'm not buying it that it's going to be the him. There are certain people that I can see it. Of course, Carmelo Hayes because of their history. Braun Breaker is another one. Um, 
and there's probably somebody else that I'm not thinking about right now, but do I think Baron Corbin will take the NXT championship away from Ilya? No. But here's the thing, though, is that that's why I wanted to see Ilya Dragunov as champion, because to me, he was the baddest mf -er on NXT. Like, I think he's way better than Braun Breaker. You know, we can argue that till the end of time. But to me, Ilya Dragunov is levels above Braun Breaker in terms of badassery. So for me, I wanted to see a champion like Ilya Dragunov because, again, it's so hard to picture anybody actually being able to defeat him, which is why I was shocked with Carmelo Hayes. When Carmelo Hayes first defeated Ilya Dragunov in that crazy-ass match that they had at the Great American Bash, I was, like, shocked. I was so shocked that they had gone through this entire epic war and that Hayes was the one that came out on top. So I do think that that is one of those things where if you tell a good story and you have a phenomenal match, then, yeah, you can see, you know, somebody like an Ilya Dragunov losing. Do I expect to see the same caliber of work between Baron Corbin and Ilya that we did with Carmelo Hayes and Ilya? No way. But I'm hoping for a good story because uh, it doesn't matter whether you love or hate Baron Corbin. I know he gets some really shitty storylines. He's gotten some really shitty storylines. But I think for the most part, he he knows what he's doing and he goes out there and he does the job. So I think that Baron Corbin, Ilya Dragunov does not stink at all. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm liking this iteration of Baron Corbin here on NXT from anything else that we been seen from him on the main roster in a very long time i'm actually happy for baron corbin uh being on nxt i've said this once and i'll say it again because poor guy was shoved in there with jbl on monday night raw dude they did him dirty with that one they really did baron corbin dirty with that one so i am happy for him being on nxt finding a new purpose and something to do on the show that doesn't stink Heidi Ho sends in a super chat saying Scarlet's tarot card said Mello was guilty last week, so it has to be true. Yeah, that was something that they said last week, and Carmelo Hayes was like, hm, I don't believe in that stuff. I don't know how many of you guys believe in that stuff. I do. I've had my tarot cards read uh, numerous times, actually. Uh, I actually had my tarot cards read like about in September, and I don't usually tell people what they tell me, but if you've ever have ever done any sort of tarot card reading, you how do I explain this? Like it really, really rocks your core, uh, especially if you believe in that stuff. I know some people don't. My husband doesn't believe in that stuff. He does not even like when I do it. Uh, he's always like, I don't know why you did that. And I'm like, <sighs> you know, but I like that stuff. So David Kaplan says your gold is cosplay made me question my life. But the Rhea Ripley cosplay put me back on track. You look lovely, by the way, says David. So I saw, don't worry, David, you're not alone. I saw a lot of comments of people questioning themselves uh, with the gold dust cosplay. That was hilarious because I had to go outside to uh, shoot that because I had the reason why I didn't appear on the collision show with the gold disc costume was because I was it was freaking hot in that thing and my AC hasn't been working that great so there was no way I was going to do that gold dust costume on the air I would have died so I had to go outside to get some fresh air and to do the little video and it was just so funny um, thankfully my streets are very calm and my neighbors are never really out of their houses so I don't think anyone saw me I didn't see anybody, so maybe they didn't see me. I don't know. Christopher Marino says, the Trick and Mellow story has me interested, but I don't give a crap about Baron Corbin. <laughs> and look, I don't blame you. Like, for everything that I just said right now about Baron Corbin, I don't blame you because WWE has spent years and years telling you not to give a shit about Baron Corbin. And so for that reason, when all of a sudden you're expected to give a shit, it's hard. It's hard for people to care. And so... Yeah, you know, I get it if you're struggling. But again, like I said, he's doing a good job on NXT. Alvin Everett says, Andre Chase got me PO'd. Uh, JC had that W. Uh, thank you so much to Alvin Everett for that super chat. We got one here from Mike Parker who says, maybe it's going to lead to Trick Williams versus Carmelo Hayes. Loser leaves NXT. will elevate Trick while letting Carmelo go to the main roster. You know, and I was very happy because we're going to talk about an act that's looking like they're on the main roster now since they just made their debut on Raw, which is the Creed Brothers. And it had really been a little bit of a minute since, but aside from the draft, like nobody had really been like called up 
in a period that wasn't the draft. So it was nice to see the Creed brothers be that act to get called up. And so who knows if Carmelo Hayes is about to go up to, I mean, I feel like at this point he's done just about all that he can do. He's had these phenomenal matches uh, with Ilya Dragunov. He's had phenomenal matches with other people. He's won NXT North American championship, the actual NXT championship, um, He's won the turn the NXT breakout tournament. I mean, he's done just about everything. Like, that's it. Like, he's done it all. Alex Ruscio sends in a super chat. Thank you so much to Alex. And then Simon Renshaw, who's been a member of the DWL for nine months, says happy Halloween. Great costume this year, Denise. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm already planning next year's too, believe it or not. Uh, I have one already, but that's about it. So we'll see what else pops up during the year. All right. So let's continue on. And, and the next topic I want to get into is the NXT Women's Breakout Tournament. Uh, final match. That's it, guys. That is it for the 2023 Breakout Tournament for the women. Uh, the men is supposed to be starting at some point they didn't say when but cody rhodes did announce it wait no hold on did they announce the breakout tournament no they announced the dusty classic now i'm forgetting if they announced the men's breakout tournament i know for sure we're doing the dusty classic whatever anyway so kaylani jordan versus lola vice and with Electra Lopez there on her side. So they were the two finals here. And I know for the most part, I think from the very beginning that we were all talking about this tournament and trying to do our predictions and everything, we already knew that it was going to be Lola Vice because she was the one that I think was the most known and maybe the most far along in terms of like, she's got the look, she's got an in-ring presence, all of it it guys all of it so for that reason i don't think anybody here was surprised when lola vice got the victory this was a fine little match uh nothing too electric but it was a match uh at one point we do see electra lopez get involved and she like kicks off kehlani who's on the top rope but kehlani continues on and she decides to do a split legged split legged moonsault and when she does this gives uh Lola Vice the opportunity to get back up, get her senses back together. And she hits her with the freaking kick that she does. That's great. I forget the name of the, her kick that she does, but whatever. She gets her with it. She gets the win. And Lola Vice is the winner of the NXT Women's Breakout Tournament. Uh, I've interviewed Lola Vice when they did the WrestleMania 39 party. And from then on, I kind of knew that she was going to be something big in WWE. Of course, she's going to continue to grow. But I had a feeling she was going to be something big since then because it's not every day that you see NXT people already get included in these media events. And that day when they did the WrestleMania 39 launch party, she was like, I think the only person from NXT or not even NXT, like just like straight up developmental. She hadn't even, she hadn't even started wrestling on NXT or anything, but she was already there. And of course, you know, she was, had already made a name for herself in mixed martial arts. So that clearly was a, a, a reason as to why she was kind of pushed a little further, maybe given these opportunities, whatever. But the point is like, she is very, very passionate and it's not easy to go and transition from one sport to another, but she freaking did it. And she seemed very passionate when I spoke to her and then look at her maybe a year later and she's on NXT and she wins this breakout tournament. I think that tells me that what she's doing uh, over on the performance center is clearly working. So uh, she's got a great look, guys. She really does. And I think she's going to get over uh, really well on NXT. And I think she might become like the new, uh, I can see her becoming similar to Mandy Rose, where like Mandy Rose was like the eye candy on the show and like the kick-ass eye candy one. I think that that's going to be Lola Vice's new uh not she's not that she's going to be like exactly like Mandy Rose, but I can see her being that eye candy person uh, on the show. David Kaplan sends in a super chat saying, what do you think the future holds for Shotzi and Scarlett? Would they be floating between the main roster and NXT? Will Scarlett ever wrestle again? I don't know if she will, but, you know, unfortunately with Scarlett, you know, doing she's there with Karrion Cross, but there isn't really much going on with Karrion Cross at all. Like I haven't talked about Karrion Cross on any of these post shows in like months because there isn't anything happening with Karrion Cross. It's been a while. There's nothing. And of course, when you're part of an act and then there's nothing happening there, then there's nothing happening with you. And so there's not really much to say right now about Scarlet. And then with Shotzi, they're doing the whole mad woman, psychotic girl 
gimmick on SmackDown. And the last thing I said about that was I kind of feel like they've toned it down a little bit and I want them to turn the volume up again on Shotzi because what they started to do with her and Bailey was good shit. And I get again, I really do feel like they've toned it down a little bit. So I think they need to bring that back up because people legitimately had an interest in Shotzi when she shaved her head and she went all crazy. People liked that. And you're not seeing that often. And I mean, you know, she went out there, she shaved her head like that to me. Like, you got to run with that, man. You got to run with it. So I hope they kind of level it up again with Shotzi there. Steven Marchuli says, which costume has been your favorite this season? Uh, I'm hoping the one that I do tomorrow because in my head, it's great. Uh, in my head, I don't know what it's going to look like once I actually execute it, but I think it's the one that I'm going to wear tomorrow. And if it's not the one from tomorrow, then it's the goldest costume, even though I only wore it for like a couple minutes. <laughs> Mike Parker says, would not surprise me to see Lola with the NXT title within six months. No, no, because... I, I'm not to take anything away from Lola, but I'm going to say no right now. Well, you know what? You did say six months. So maybe my no is not too strong. But right now I'm at a no. And the reason for that is I had said this last week, but when Lyra Valkyra won and defeated Becky Lynch for that championship, I said this, you cannot BS her run. Becky Lynch, who's a big ass freaking star, to not put this woman over for her championship reign to not last very long. So I want to see Lyra go on and carry this bout for a long ass time. If we can see Mandy Rose hold that bout for like a year, I think, I think we should see Lyra Valkyria do something of a long reign like that too. Because right now I'm not seeing anybody that should be taking the title away from Lyra Valkyria. I'm sorry. That's where I'm at right now. Nobody should be taking the title away from her. And if they eat, I don't think they're going to do this, but if they even dare hot potato her championship, oh, I'm going to be pissed. I'm going to be so mad, and I don't get mad often, but I will be mad. <laughs> um, but I don't think they're going to do that. So there's no point in saying I'm going to get mad if it's not looking like it's going to happen. Hopefully they don't. Can you imagine that? I mean, never say never, right? Card subject to change. But uh, no, that would be like real crap. So Lola down the road, but not right now, because right now it is Lyra's time. Uh, thank you so much to Mike Parker, though, for the super chat, because I get what you were saying. Now you're putting over Lola, which, yeah, let her do it. But yeah, I do agree from Jared here, who says, let Lola cook for a minute. Yeah, exactly. I think that she still has to go out there and continue to um, continue to just freaking grow, just continue to grow and to show what she can do because we've only seen very little of Lola. Of course, what we've seen, we've liked, but we want to see a lot more happen there. Oh man, I messed this up. It's this way. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's press on um, from here. All right, let's get into um, the next matchup here that I want to talk about. And this one here is the Creed Brothers versus Angel Garza and Humberto Carrillo in the Spin the Wheel, Make the Deal, Table Slatters and Scares match. Uh, I love that title. I always forget it though. So I really had to read that one because I want to say Table Slatters and Chairs and I always forget that it's Scares. But here we go. This is the match that opened up the night, and this was a freaking banger, man. Aside from the main events, this was the best match that we saw uh, the entire night. And a big reason for this is that they had so many power moves that were done uh, in this match, and they were done through tables. I mean, you were seeing the, I think, yes, I think tonight is the best work that we have seen from Angel Garza and Humberto Carrillo. If there is anything else that I'm not thinking about, please write it in the comments right now because I have not seen anything better from Angel Garza and Humberto Carrillo in anything that they've done on the main roster than they did here tonight. Like this was the best, hands down. They did some great teamwork. They had some big spots in this match along with the Creed brothers and the Creed brothers are freaking phenomenal. They could have easily made Garza and Carrillo look like goofs, right? In terms of like they were, they could have easily been on a whole other level and made them look like they weren't on that level. But that wasn't the case. They looked on the level of the Creed brothers in this match with what they did. And that to me was the best part about this because I have known for a long time because I've been following Angel Garza's career for a while now, okay, guys? Uh, for a while. I mean, I have multiple interviews with this guy before he even signed 
to the WWE, okay? And I was watching him in the Indies. I was watching his work in Mexico, uh, all of that stuff long before he came to WWE. So I have known for a very long time the things that Angel Garza is capable of in terms of like actually getting over, becoming a star, having charisma. You have not only heard me talk about this, but you've heard Sean talk about this when it comes to people that have an insane amount of charisma at media scrums. Angel Garza ranks up there with some of the biggest superstars when it comes to just overall charisma. And a lot of people wouldn't know it because they don't let them show that on TV, at least from the main roster, from what they were doing for the longest time. All they were letting them do was the pants thing and the kisses thing. That was literally it. But there was so much more there uh, to you know, to chip away at with both of these guys. And so I'm very happy with the work that they did here. I was loved all of the big spots that they did. Uh, Julius putting Angel through the table on top of Umberto. Um, they put Brutus through a table at one point. We got the crowd chanting, holy shit. We did. We saw Angel do a drop kick onto Brutus, who was sitting on a chair inside the ring. Julius did a senton on both guys. And then Brutus ball to Umberto. Fucking love the Brutus ball. Uh, the one that they did on Raw was even more phenomenal because they did an on Otis and Otis is this big huge guy but Freed Brothers get their victory it was awesome thumbs up please do more with Angel Garza and Umberto let's freaking go with them guys like this is their chance NXT has been the place where people get second chances where people get to show what they can do Dijak, Apollo, Mandy so many other people and let's have that officially happen for Angel Garza and Umberto. All right, let's get some good stuff in here. Let's see. Let's see. What do we got? Uh, we got a super chat here from Will Chisholm who says, in the words of Sheamus, that match was a banger after banger after banger after banger. Both teams looked great. Uh, completely agreed. That was a banger. Uh, thank you so much to Will Chisholm for the super chat, by the way. Appreciate that, man. And I'm, lo I'm looking to see if there was anything else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> YT's got something in that one, but this one's funny. I mean, because I asked the chat if there was anything else that you really loved from Angel Garza and Umberto, and YT says, the time Garza kicked the rose up of Drew Gulak's butt doesn't even compare. <laughs> Bro, when they did that, that shit was scandalous, man. I saw that, and I was like, what are we doing? What are we doing? What is this? Uh, good one, YT. Thank you so much for reminding me of that. I appreciate that. Um, all right, so... Let's go ahead and uh, continue on from here. <laughs> oh, man. That's so funny. All right. Let's go. <laughs> you broke me. You seriously broke me. Um, and Zeno Hour says, what a crazy 48 hours for the Creeds. Agreed. Crazy 48 hours for them. All right. Let's move on because we got another match to talk about. And that is Dominic Mysterio defending this NXT North American Championship against Rhea Ripley. Uh, some funny stuff here was Rhea Ripley came out dressed as a cop. I think she was a cop or a security or a sheriff, whatever. And Dominic was like the prisoner and he comes out and he's handcuffed. And <laughs> they did a whole little bit for that for the entrance. So that was kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> and... <laughs> During the match, though, I will say this. The match was perfectly okay. It was a lot of Nathan Frazier, you know, doing his thing. Nathan Frazier is very good. I love Nathan Frazier. He's awesome on NXT. But there's some good moments here. I liked that there was a moment that Dom and Rhea were on the outside and they were kind of, you know, doing the lover's eyes. It was like googly eyes at each other, like fondling, like, oh, my God, you're so beautiful. <laughs> And then out of nowhere, Nathan Frazier comes in and just does a dive on them. So I thought that was really cool, too. A really nice super kick from Nathan at one point. And then there was another moment where we saw Nathan uh, go to the top rope, but he was he ended up being thrown into the commentary table. So Dominic ended up hitting his frog splash and got the win for that one. Again, this match wasn't bad. It wasn't great either, but it wasn't bad. So there's really nothing us to really say about this. Um, the only thing to say about this is that after this match, I was thinking, who's going to take the title from Dominic? Like, who's going to be the guy? Because I know that uh, Sean had reported that Mustafa Ali was supposed to become the NXT North American champion. And, you know, and he was doing the whole politician gimmick. And unfortunately, we only got to see a glimpse of that because then afterwards he was released. So Mustafa Ali was supposed to be like, you know, in line for the title. So then I'm thinking, OK, who's going to be the guy to take it off of Dom? Well, 
I thought it. And then like a couple seconds later, I had an answer because Wesley came back and he ended up attacking Dominic Mysterio, picked up the title, looked at it, and it looks like they're going back to Wesley. So what, I don't know if he's going to win. I'm assuming he is. I don't feel like they're going to do this whole comeback and then have him lose to Dominic Mysterio. So I'm kind of expecting to see Wesley get the win here over Dominic. Uh, Wesley was a good champion, guys. He was a good champion. Um, so I guess it'd be cool if they did if they ran it back with Wesley as North American champion. But I hope we kind of get, um, you know, just a little bit more going on with them there than just a quick passing of the belt. So I would like to see, you know, get them creative with the, with the actual storylines and whatnot. But that's where we're at right now. And so it looks like a lot of people are pretty much expecting the same thing. Wesley for the championship to be the one to take it off of Dominic. But who knows? Because I'm trying to think like, yeah, you, you could name some other guys, but they're kind of doing something else, right? Like you got your Braun Breakers of the world, but he's out there doing stuff with the Von Wagner situation. So I'm trying to think if there's anybody else. Carmelo's doing his whole thing with Trick Williams. Who else? That would be North American Championship material that's not really doing anything else right now. If you guys have any good names, send them in. All right. But in the meantime, let's talk about Braun Breaker. So Braun Breaker has this match with Robert Stone. And you know what? It's funny, but I have had a soft spot in my heart for Robert Stone here, uh, especially in this match, because he's out there fighting for a friend. That is nice, man. The man is half the half the size of Braun Breaker. He hasn't wrestled in like forever. Uh, dude's going up against Braun Breaker, who's this beast of a man, uh, only for the sake of defending his friend and because of what Braun Breaker did to Von Wagner. If you ask me, that is a good friend. And it made me become a fan of Robert Stone in all of this because I can see that happening. How many of us wouldn't stand up to somebody that's 10 times bigger than us just to defend the honor of someone we cared about? I'm pretty sure a lot of us would. So for that reason, Robert Stone Congratulations. You officially have a spot in my heart. But anyways, so he goes in there and he gets killed, which is pretty much what we were expecting. Braun Breaker gets the win. Nothing much else to say other than the post-match was super obvious. I kind of hated the post-match angle because I was like, oh, this is so obvious. This is kind of boring. So post-match. We see him throw out Robert Stone, and I was expecting him to like beat the life out of him. That's kind of what I wanted to see. But instead, he throws him out, teases that he's going to smash his head with the steel steps the way that he did to his friend Von Wagner. But instead, Von Wagner comes out and then he attacks Braun Breaker. And in the moment, he kind of has this thing where he's not very well. So anytime he like gets too worked up, all of a sudden he starts to grab his head. He's like me with this very tight hair net. That shit just hurts. So that's what's happening with Von Wagner. He's still, you know, loop-de-loop. -loop. He's not all there. And backstage, he tries. So he doesn't successfully take out Braun Breaker. Braun Breaker is able to run away. But backstage, he wants a match against Braun Breaker. He wants to finish this off. And Robert's telling them, nope, nope, you're not okay yet. You cannot do this match. You cannot do it. Well, NXT said, screw it, this guy's getting his match, even if he's not okay. Dude has a big-ass freaking band around his head, and dude is wrestling next week against Braun Breaker. So we're getting that match. Uh, I'm expecting it to be Braun Breaker. I'm expecting that Von Wagner is not even going to be able to wrestle, and so Braun Breaker is going to like finish him off, and then you're going to be like, oh my god, what's going to happen to Von Wagner? And Maybe he's going to be gone again for like a long time. I don't know. But I'm not really expecting a full-fledged match next week. I'm pretty sure that the whole uh, head thing is going to get in the way of Von Wagner actually defeating Braun Breaker or anything like that. Will Chisholm says, well, my theory of Wesley attacking Trick is dead. <laughs> Isn't that sucks, huh? When you formulate a whole ass theory and you're like, I got it. I worked out the entire storyline and then it doesn't happen. And then you're just there like, damn, my storyline didn't come true. The amounts of times that that has happened to me. Uh, I've come up with things in my head and I'm like, yes, this is exactly where it's going. Goes nowhere near that. Will Chisholm, thank you so much for the super chat. We got enough. Oh, my shit, Lord. Mike Parker sent in a... <laughs> <laughs> sent in uh, 10 gifted memberships to the DWO. Mike Parker, thank you so very much. I appreciate that. Uh, you and Sheldon sharing these memberships has been uh, really, really incredible. Um, very, very awesome. So thank you so much to everybody who's done that. Um, all right. So 
Let's press on from here and let's get into Tiffany Stratton versus Fallon Henley. So I was actually looking forward to watching this match, but it didn't actually happen because Tiffany Stratton attacked Fallon Henley before the match actually started. She tossed her on the barricade. She like literally made her eat shit on the ring post. Like, bro, just threw her, smashed her right in there. I was like, damn, what did Fallon Henley ever do to you? She mocked you like one time and you're breaking this girl's face on a ring post. That's freaking savage, Tiffany. And then afterwards, she gets her with a figure four. So this match doesn't ever actually happen, which I'm cool with because now things have gotten extra personal. I'm fine with this. Cool, we'll keep it going. Metaphor. Metaphor are backstage doing a whole, um, they do a whole vignette. Uh, I think they should do like three vignettes or two vignettes throughout the show. And basically they do like this whole Scooby-Doo thing where they're out there looking for his Heritage Cup championship in this like horror mansion. And Akira Tozawa is like the mastermind behind all of this. And this all leads to Noam Dar finally finding his Heritage Cup. And then there was a really nasty scene where he gets really close up to the Heritage Cup and he like starts licking it like a dog because he's Scooby-Doo. That was gross. But anyways, <laughs> Tozawa forces him to make a match. And so next week, we are going to be seeing to Tozawa versus uh, Noam Dar. And I'm pretty sure they're going to keep the Heritage title with Noam Dar. But it would be really freaking great if we were to see Tozawa win. We it would be great if we were to see Tozawa win. And then all of a sudden, all of Noam Dar's friends decide they don't want to be friends with him anymore because he doesn't have the Heritage, Heritage Cup anymore. And then they just go. And all of a sudden, they're like, Akira Tozawa's posse. And then all of a sudden, Akira Tozawa goes from always being the background guy to having his own posse and being like the new Queen Bee. I would like that. I want to see Akira Tozawa get all the flowers because dude is funny as all hell. Uh, let's see what else we got here. YT, who's been a member of the DWO for nine months, says he would love to see Lyra versus Mako. Yeah, that would probably be really cool and hard hitting. Heidi Ho says, never do a Tiffy cosplay, Denise. It ain't worth it. It would be hard. It would be hard with the blonde hair and and plus she's always showing her belly. I don't I can't show my belly, guys. I eat potato chips, I eat pizza, I eat bagels. There's no abs there. Can't show the belly. Uh ain't gonna <laughs> ain't gonna happen. <laughs> TMI. TMI, but it's true, guys. TMI, but it is true. I ain't going to be showing the belly. Ain't going to be happening. Uh it was funny because someone on YouTube got upset that I wore like yoga shorts or bike. Well, they're technically biker shorts uh, for my Rhea Ripley cosplay. And I'm like, I'm not going to come out and be exactly like Rhea Ripley. Like, what are we doing here? I'm not going to come out in the trunks that she wears. Like, ain't no way that's happening. Uh, and that was the reason why, because I wasn't going to be showing everything. Like, dang, guys, it's Halloween. It's supposed to be inspired by. <laughs> So there you go. But anyways, we're going to go ahead and uh, press on before I dig myself in a bigger hole uh, with my TMI. All right. So Joe Gacy promo. Looks like Joe Gacy may be getting a new character. I don't really know where we're going here uh, with this. If anybody has any great theories, please let me know. And I want to see how they finish off the whole um, schism thing. We haven't seen anything else. Don't know what's happening. This is a wait and see type of situation. Wait and see. Will Chisholm says, I'm six foot four. I wouldn't let my five foot friend, my five foot eight friend take up for me with a jacked man. Mr. Stone was stupid. <laughs> Look, if something happened to me and my friend wanted to fight somebody who was bigger than them in my honor, I would let them be like, damn, I feel special. Like what? Mom Von Wagner, I'd feel really special. <laughs> Will Chisholm, thank you so much for the super chat. All right, guys, and uh, let's press on from here. Yeah, Miguel Ortiz says schism's over. Yeah, I'm done. Nothing more to say about them. There, It wasn't like we were really missing out on anything there either, to be honest. Uh, schism kind of had an expiration date for a while. All right, some miscellaneous items on the show that happened on NXT. Uh, the miscellaneous topics, we kind of touched on a little bit already, but Isla, Dawn, and Alba Fire, uh, they were the host in this uh, match. And I actually just realized that I skipped a match. I'm sorry, everybody. But Chelsea Green and Piper Niven had a match against uh, 
Thea Hale and JC Jane, excuse me, Thea Hale and JC Jade. And this was for the WWE Women's Tag Team Championship. Okay. So this was a fun match. They get started off really well right off the bat. They get it started hot. Really good stuff there. Love the interactions between JC Jane and Chelsea Green. Uh, at one point, they both knock each other out with a kick to the face. All women go the down. Uh, that was really cool. We see Chelsea hit the unprettier on JC and she gets the victory. But the cool part about all of this, besides actually getting to see Chelsea Green and Piper Niven successfully, defend their titles in a match with a new team that we haven't seen before I thought was great but the other thing that I really enjoyed about this is that Alba Fire and Island Dawn were watching from the little stage area and they are now looking to be going after Chelsea Green and Piper Niven at least that's my understanding of this because that is what we saw and they even did like this spooky thing where they made this the wheel spin and I was thinking to myself like damn We've been waiting for them to do something with them on SmackDown. They haven't done anything. They had to go back to NXT to get their story for the main roster, even though they were drafted to the main roster months ago during the WWE draft. But nothing had happened really with Alba Fire and Isla Dawn other than losing the titles to Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler, only for them to lose it like a week later. That was totally shocking and surprising. <laughs> so you see where I'm saying that? And I sped that up on purpose to everybody. You follow me. You follow me here. I haven't even had sugar. Um, all right. Actually, technically, I think I did. I had Jamba Juice while I was watching NXT, like the uh, peach drink. I'm assuming they put sugar in that. That's probably explains that. Anyway, so <laughs> we finally get to see Alba Fire and Isla Dawn uh, start an actual story that should be playing out on the main roster. So thumbs up because I really like those girls and I think they're a good team and they're an actual tag team. We don't have actual women's tag teams. So I was very happy for that. And also the other thing that I want to say about Chelsea Green and Piper Niven, they are the team we never knew we wanted. I love Piper Niven and Chelsea Green. Love them together. Good stuff. Sheldon Jackson sends in a super chat saying, I said that I would admit when I said that I would admit when I would admit that I'm starting to like, what? No. What? All right. Hold the phone here. Backstory. Sheldon Jackson has never been a fan of JC Jane. Ever. And it finally started to happen. Sheldon Jackson says he said that he would admit when he started to like JC Jane. The storyline is slowly, start, slowly starting to make him a fan of hers. I'm now a 30% fan of hers when the last time it was 5%. Sheldon, I think the last time was like negative 20%. So you went from the negatives way over and now you're 30%. That's good. I knew it. I knew it would happen. I think had the story between JC Jane, excuse me, let me rephrase that. I think had the matches between Gigi Dolan and JC Jane been better, I think you would have been a fan by now. Because of course, the story was there with JC and Gigi, you know, former friends and toxic attraction turned enemies. That was a great story. Good stuff. Good promo work. All of that. But the matches left a lot to be desired. So I think had those matches really been great. And I think you probably would have been a fan faster, but uh, I get it because it's stuff that she's doing with the Hale and Andre Chase is pretty lovable. So uh, it's easy to kind of start getting behind that. Uh, Abraham Biella says, just left a review for you on Instant Culture on Apple Podcasts. Wishing you the best. Thank you so much, Abraham. BTW, uh, I've gotten the most reviews that I've ever gotten before this weekend because I did like a big push. I promoted it everywhere. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Like I was on it, like promoting it. And uh, I'm so happy because later tonight I will be reading the new uh, reviews that I got. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, Apple Podcasts kind of takes like a day for them to pop up. So if you left one and I don't read it tonight, I'll probably read it tomorrow or Friday. Uh, I check every day for new reviews. And every time I see a new one, I'll go ahead and bring it up. But we got quite a few that I'm going to read later tonight. So Abraham, thank you so much for taking the time to do that. Because I know that it's not easy. And I know that Apple Podcasts doesn't really make it that easy to leave a review. You have to press like a lot of buttons. So uh, thank you so much for pressing all of those and leaving a review uh honestly some people were asking me to do like a little tutorial on how to leave a review because it's kind of complicated and so i need to look into that and maybe i'll work up a little video and show people because i know it's kind of like complicated uh abraham thank you so much though and of course to anybody who wants to leave a review and figure all that out uh that's in the description box below and you can press the link and then just you know kind of figure it out from there 
Uh, Abraham, thank you so much. And Denisha Lane, thank you so much, who also said she left a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much. Uh, seriously. Um, all right. So now we need to get into the rest of the other topics that I was talking about. And the other things we need to get into is that we had a really good video that was kind of hyping up Lyra Valkyra. She's going to be back next week. That's going to be her return. And they did a whole video basically just recapping the events that went down with her and Becky, how she inspired people, the media interview that she did. Uh, really good stuff, honestly. Then we also saw a brand new character for, for Reggie, the former Scripps. Also, he's still Scripps, though, but a different type of Scripps. So Reggie's new character is that he's uh, part of a group, and they're called Out the Mud. And he's got these new friends. And he says that they're reminding him of who he used to be. And he says, I'm Reggie, but my friends, they all call me Scripps. And he's talked about, you know, growing up in the streets and having a hard time. He says that he saw his uncle die in his room when he was 11. Uh, I do not know anything about that story. So I need to look that up. And he starts to talk shit about the brawling birds, saying that they know nothing, that they know nothing about the culture. They don't know anything of that. And um, the thing that I will say about this is that they have not given up on Reggie. When he came out as Scripps in that horrendous orange and brown mask, they did him dirty with that one. They really did. And it took a lot for them for him to bounce back. Uh, I feel like this is the first like decent thing that they've done with him because it was really a struggle to convince people, I think, that Reggie slash Scripps wasn't like he was too, he was presented so, so goofy that and not goofy in a goofy way where you like enjoy it. No, so goofy where you're like, dude, this is bad. Like this is rough. And so because of that, I feel like they've had to do a lot of work to really give him some dignity back, give his character some dignity, have people actually care about him. So this is honestly like the first good step that they've taken for Reggie. So I'm hoping that this works because again, he can do, he has a background in like Cirque du Soleil. So he can do all of these fancy flips and moves and things like that. And stuff like that's always going to get over. But of course, when you have a terrible character like Scripps, that was rough. Um, so I'm happy that they didn't give up on him and they kept trying to find something different, something that would work for Reggie. Because they could have easily, easily just been like, dude, we can't find nothing for you. We done. We screwed up. We can't find nothing for you. Like, sit it out. They could have easily done that, but they didn't. So, you know what? I'm glad that they're starting to uh, figure something out. So, we'll see how this one goes. We'll see if it sticks. Uh, we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't think a lot of people like this. <laughs> I don't know. I'm seeing a couple of people that don't like this new stuff. But to be honest, I just don't know. This is the best thing that they've done. It's better than what he was doing with that mask. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Tiger Claw Gaming says no friend would ever call a friend scripts. <laughs> I don't know. I don't like nicknames, to be honest. Like, I think people should just be called, be called by their actual names. Like, whatever your name is, like, that's what you should be called. Uh, I'm not into nicknames. <laughs> but actually, I'm lying, though. There's a couple of people that I have nicknames for. My aunt, she used to have a nickname for me. She used to piss me off with this nickname. But now I've grown to love it. And I'm not going to tell you guys what it was, because if I tell you guys what it is, there's going to be people in the comments calling me this. And I know I will not bring that back. <laughs> will not bring it back. All right. So you guys will never know. It'll be the mystery of life. Lexus King. He has a backstage interview and this is good stuff here. So this is what we got. He's talking about how he's so pleased with his performance from his debut match at Halloween Havoc and that he says that everybody out there has an opinion about him, but that, you know what, that comes with the territory of being a star. So now I'm getting an even clearer version of what they're doing here, right? So we already knew that he's like renouncing his dad, right? Like he's not paying any respect to his dead father, none of that. But now he's also extremely entitled. Remember when I said that, like, I got his character and I understood, like, in terms of, like, supporting him, I got it. But now he's being entitled. 
I ain't going to support him no more. No way. So I like this. I like that they added this uh, to his heel persona because I feel like I said at first, it was a little complicated, but you could understand why he might not want to, uh, you know, why he might not to ha- want to have your, his father's name. You understood that. I understood it. But now he's acting entitled. Nobody likes entitled people. We just don't like that. So a lot of people have been mentioning that he's very like 80s hair band type of person. So he kind of does a, I think he did a Bon Jovi quote because it's Bon Jovi. It's my life. You know, it's a really good song. He says, it's my life and I'm going to start doing things my way. I'm like, there's no way that wasn't purposely done. Like that had to be on purpose, right guys? Like that had to be on purpose. The Bon Jovi line. We'll see. Anyways, here's the part that I thought that they could have taken it up a notch. He starts to flirt with Mackenzie Mitchell. And they have acknowledged that Mackenzie Mitchell is with Vic Joseph on the show. Like, I'm pretty sure they've acknowledged this. And Mackenzie Mitchell's saying, mm, and she leaves, right? Vic Joseph didn't sell it. He didn't say anything. Bro, that's your wife out there getting hit on by freaking Lexus King. I would have liked it if Vic Joseph said something on commentary like, God damn it, this guy. I don't know, something, uh, anything. That's your girl up there. And he's out here flirting with her. Oh, hells no. I also want to see Mackenzie Mitchell be like really sassy. I hope they give her like a really sassy line where she's just like freaking fed up with this guy. Anytime she has to interview him, she's he's this entitled asshole who thinks that anything belongs to him. That's what I would love to see, uh, kind of a chemistry between uh, Alexis King and Mackenzie Mitchell. I think that would be pretty cool. We'll see. <laughs> Tiger Claw says, what is Vic Joseph going to do? I don't know. Throw his candy at him. Something. Say awful things about him on commentary. <laughs> Spread rumors on commentary. <laughs> That's about it. Or he's going to be like Robert Stone trying to be up there wrestling Braun Breaker. <laughs> it's going to be the same thing, but Vic Joseph and Lexus King. <laughs> Good stuff, man. All right, guys. Uh, we got a couple more things to get into really quickly. NXT deadline will be back. And they are bringing back the Iron Survivor Challenge. And they did announce that they're going to be having WWE Hall of Famers return to pick the participants like they did last time, as well as doing like the qualifying matches. So they're going to be doing uh, a bunch of that in preparation for NXT deadline. Next week, we're going to be seeing Tazawa versus Noam Dar for the Heritage Cup. We're going to be seeing the return of Lyra. The qualifying matches begin for the Iron Survivor for both men and women. And then Braun Breaker versus Von Wagner is also happening next week. All right, guys, I want to go ahead and highlight the people that left some reviews on the Apple podcast page. I seriously thank anybody who did because that helped my podcast out a lot. And I feel like I need to promote that a lot more because you know, that's just a new way for people to discover your work and, you know, see your podcast and stuff. And it also helps with advertisers and just all of that good stuff. So I want to shout out the people that um, did that. And the first one here is Bacon. <laughs> Green Vega 777 wrote Bacon, but I don't care because he gave me five stars. So I'm good with that. D Kamai 06 says, unique and one of a kind. The best part of listening to Denise's content is you know she is genuine. Since she watched as a little girl with her uncle, she had her own opinion on what she enjoys and doesn't enjoy. Her thoughts aren't phony or trying to be something she isn't. She's a legit fan, and it's why I've loved her content since following after seeing her on Wrestle Talk and Quizlemania during the pandemic. If you enjoy just an honest fan's opinion and enjoy the passion behind them look no further than denise hollywood salcedo thank you so much oh my god that is so sweet by the way i haven't read any of these i wanted to read them for the first time on the air so like this is my first time reading all of these that was so sweet um, this is from Merlizo, who says, hardest worker in the business. Love Denise's content. She covers all aspects of pro wrestling, and she's very thorough. If you missed a show or just want to hear someone break down a show, she's the person to go to. I love that. Thank you so much to Merlizio, um, for that review. This is from Toli Diox who says, um, Hollywood Denise Salcedo, one of the most important voices in professional wrestling that isn't signed to a major company. Great cast. Thank you so much um, to Toli Diox. I'm pretty sure I had a hard time pronouncing that, but thank you so much for that. Um, This is from Austin Ho J, who says, great analysis and great fun. One of the best pro wrestling analysts out there. Strongly recommend Denise for her knowledgeable takes and her ability to put on an entertaining show. Austin, thank you so much. This is from Cursive Kiss 2, who says, 
Choo Choo, long live the queen. <laughs> I can't believe Choo Choo is still over. A metal chick for life says Choo Crew. Denise is simply the best in the game right now. Fun, knowledgeable, and the only podcast I seriously look for and download as soon as it's available. Thank you for being so cool. Big shout out to Reg as well. Check all her podcast interviews. All the best, Ben. Sven, thank you so freaking much. And I'm so happy to hear that you download this podcast immediately. Thank you. This is from uh, Commander in Queef who says such good shit. Denise always keeps it real and brings the energy positive without being pandering critical without being unnecessarily negative. Choo choo. The train's headed to the top. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you so much to commander in Kui for this. This is from sun 5150 who says fun podcast. Denise's podcast is a lot of fun. She's very funny and very knowledgeable. I always have a good laugh when listening or watching on YouTube. Hashtag next strong hashtag choo choo. Let's go. I need to market this man. Mahoney413 says, it's Denise. Been listening to Denise for a little over a year now. She kills it all the time. This is one of the, my go-to podcasts. She does a great job reviewing shows and does excellent interviews. Her YouTube shows also top-notch, especially when she covers the AEW media scrums all around the best. Mahoney413, thank you for taking the time. And last one, this is from Zoom Great, who says, Superstar. Denise has new members on your channel. Thank you for positive vibes and good energy every day on the live stream. And you're not biased and appreciated. Uh, you deserve, you wish for. Um, thanks, Superstar Denise. Thank you so much. That is so sweet. I love that. Um, 13 new reviews. That's the most I've ever gotten all at one time. So thank you so much to everybody who took the time uh, to seriously leave those reviews. If you want to be one of those, please do. Again, link is in the description box below. Other than that, guys, that is it for today's show. Uh, thank you to everybody. And I will be back tomorrow for AEW Dynamite. And I will be joined by Reg. And then I will be back on Friday to discuss SmackDown. And then Saturday, I'm doing a post show at night to cover Crown Jewel. And then Sunday, I will be back too for an AEW Collision post show. So as you guys know, when there's pay-per-views, things get switched around. So the schedule looks a little different this week because of Crown Jewel. But I'll still get the AW Collision podcast out there. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. And enjoy your Halloween. Goodbye, everyone.